Hello my friends, if you like my work please remember to click thumb up, subscribe to my channel or hit the notification bell to be informed about new videos. I'd just like to say thank you to all my patrons, please join them if you can, the link is in the description below. As I had two similar models which you can see by clicking on the open the box review link that is just being displayed above, for this movie I chose Jagdpanzer. So both models came to me from my friend who asked to build and paint them. He gave me a completely free hand in finishing so I was free to approach the subject and only the sky was the limit. I collected metal trucks, barrels, resin exhaust and I was planning a little scratch to increase its value even more. In the beginning I started with the suspension bar and immediately noticed that the gluing surface was definitely too small. I was afraid that it might not withstand the tension. The solution was as simple as a toothpick. The wheels that were closer to the hull were drilled and I glued sticks into them and I also drilled holes in the bar and farther in the wall of the main body. The outer wheels had a similar problem but here I didn't want to drill in the long axles and decided to stick small pieces of plastic into the spaces between the wheels. In this way the chassis was glued together and very stable. The idler wheels also required additional work. I measured the gap using a piece of truck. The thin piece of plastic did the trick and now the size was right. Before the correction there was no room for the trucks to fit perfectly. A different arrangement was out of the question because under normal conditions the guide teeth would go inside the wheel and not outside. I covered the free space with masking tape and hardened it with super glue. It was another quick upgrade to hide the imperfections. When we are at the wheels it's time for trucks. The fuel model set for the late King Tiger is the best solution to enrich my model. So what is my way to put the whole set together fast and easy? Here it is. I have built a special and sophisticated tool by myself. Two metal angle bars which are about 20 cm long, the holes for screws were drilled at the ends, as you can see the springs press the whole thing down, that's all. I put the links at the ends to keep the distance between the bars and now I add the links one by one pressing them from time to time. When the section is ready I insert the wire to correct length, pull it out a bit and cut. After that I press it down because it cannot be seen. You can also close the holes with pieces of plastic but it's a really huge work and generally it won't be visible. I did it once and it was a really long story. As you can see it works perfectly and thanks to this I can put together the set between 60 and 80 minutes. As all we know some sets require drilling in each link. Luckily I didn't have this problem here and most of the links were made correctly. When I was looking for a metal bar for this model I wanted to find a 12.8 caliber of course and luckily I managed to find one. Now the most important thing was to adjust it to the plastic parts. It wasn't so difficult, the only problem was that the contact area was quite small and the bar itself was heavy. On the imitation of the lock I attached a counterweight which was the largest nut I could find. Now it was necessary to build a gun mounted. The entire structure is based on plastic strips. First I glued two pieces to the bar to have space. Then I glued strips along the bar as a base to create the actual cover. I formed the shape of the cover with plain masking tape and a bit of green stuff. Leaving it to dry I used the time to make the two coats of the easy cast and create a texture of the cast steel. Two layers do the job and the most important thing is to do it accurately and not to cover details such as assembly screws. This solution can be diluted with water and dries very quickly. Additionally you can speed it up with a hair dryer. If you don't have one it's time to borrow it from your woman. Back to the mantlet. I covered it with two coarse easy cast layers and let them dry. After sanding the effect wasn't as good as I needed so I took my old Tamiya putty and covered it with one more layer. Next sanding and I'm almost there. Finally the best thing is to install the muzzle brake. I love it. And the barrel is ready. Oh and the last element. I don't know what its professional name is but 
I suppose it would be used to carry the gun by train. Oh no, crane, sorry. I always like it on the models. Later I will add the weld seams and now check the extra effects on the casting. Now the texture for the entire front plate. I applied two coats again. Here you can see exactly how much it is needed. Sanding again, this time much stronger because we have an armor plate here, not a pure casting. I also finished the cover. With sanding of course. On each frame with parts we have small numbers that we can easily use. The trick is to cut them off as accurate as possible. Without a sharp knife there is no chance to do it. When they are ready it's the best to stick them with an ordinary plastic glue and then even out with the same specifics that we used to make the casting texture. Delicious. These were supposed to be mounts to the side covers but in my model I have a different idea. So now the top of the hole is ready to be glued to the bottom. I also added the rear side shields and the engine cover. For me these brackets are needed for side covers. I slightly drill them to make it easier to mount the plastic profiles. Of course there are also traces of the armor plates flame cutting. I always make them because they look realistic and truly speaking we try to imitate the metal look of our model, right? In some places I cut larger grooves. Why? Because it's more interesting. Irregularity is even advisable. Why? Because it's more interesting. I smoothed all the cuts with thin glue. From the plastic profiles I prepared the frames for hanging the side covers. Later the ends will be bent a little. There are no perfect vehicles, only in the factory. Now we are gonna throw out those nasty periscope imitations. I found several identical ones that could be used here. I cut them to the correct size and glued the covers. Little things. When I was buying other sets with grills I didn't know if they would fit for these models. Luckily they are perfect and I can recommend them if you want to enrich your model. Unfortunately the rest of the set is useless here. But wait, wait. I used also chains and this small ring with the mesh. In the set from Paper Panzer Productions I have a resin exhaust with an additional towing device. I did a small upgrade by replacing the mounting screws on the covers. The new ones were punched from plastic and glued in places around the tubes. It was a bit of precision work but it was worth of the time I spent. Each nut was nailed on the fresh and sharp hobby blade, dipped in the glue gently and added to the correct place. Then I sanded them lightly, checking the strength of the glue, cleaned them from the dust and the exhaust were ready for assembly. Note the hole. It looks great with this chains on locking bolt. It's a really nice upgrade kit for all of the German What If series heavy tanks. We can use them on E family, King Tigers, Jagd Tigers and Luwe. The copper wire was needed to make a ladder. After firing and softening it's easier to bend, straighten, cut, sand and glue. Here I decided to make this element by joining the individual parts with super glue. Next time we'll do some soldering. I took the dimensions of the ladder from my head, checking only if the width was adequate for the climbing person. It was a simple task. I was wondering more if the ladder would withstand bending. But a good clean up of the parts gave a perfect result and everything held up nicely. I will say more. It was possible to gently bend it to imitate uncareful driving on reverse. And a bit more about exhausts. I decided to use Flammvernichters because I have always liked their appearance. Sounds strange, but what can I do? Additionally, I placed them in a rather unusual configuration, asymmetrically. If you look from the back and the side, you will see the strange settings in both cases. Please don't ask me for justification. Those little screw holes were too small for me. I decided to drill and I was hoping that I wouldn't drill right through. Unfortunately, I did it three times. I punched the larger screw heads from the plastic and inserted them and secured with a thin glue. They looked much better. I also glued these three holes and managed to bring them out to the right look. 
One might ask why I didn't do it when the hole was still unglued. The answer is simple, I just forgot. Adding the metal bars was a piece of cake. Simple work, just a little drilling and we have the armament ready. As you can see the flag from master model and the machine gun from RB model are doing the job. The main part itself is not sophisticated but luckily it will be almost completely hidden in the turret and it will be movable. A bit of an upgrade to the exterior was necessary. This turret resembles the modern one from BMP but the details that I added here are my artistic license. Metal lifting holders and a few plastic details enrich it and there isn't much to say here. Everyone can see how does it look like. For me the designers of this model seem to be lazy guys but on the other hand these empty surfaces give the opportunity to show off and this is the result after building and adding to the model. Pretty cool, I like it. Hope you also like it so click the like button and subscribe my channel if you haven't already. All the welding seams are made from green stuff. Of course a little water is necessary otherwise we won't be able to roll out the putty properly. First thin sausages or snakes, whatever. Then fit them on the model and press the right shape. On this model as well as on E60 I made C-shaped and oblong welds. Maybe someone who knows will let me know in the comments section what are they professionally called. So a little bit of tinkering and it's ready. I also added small cubes for fenders similar to those we know from Tiger 1. To make them fast and easy I used the cutter from RP Tools. And more welding. Eureka XXL towing cables are a perfect solution, especially because in the kit were only plastic imitations and I threw them away in the beginning. The most important thing in the treatment is to gently clean the resin ends. A bit of glue on the rope and we can insert them into the holes which are perfectly prepared and there aren't problems with fitting. From the leftovers of some upper sets I use a piece of metal plate to make rope holders. First I heated them with a torch for softening the material. Then I bent them into a small U-shaped pieces and glue it to the model. Homemade photo etching. For the first time I had to deal with 3D printed handles and I must say that I won't make typical photo etched elements anymore. The time is money and this solution is undoubtedly a great help during work. The most important thing is to carefully cut them off and prepare for adding to the kit. Great quality and great details. The price isn't low but it's really worth it. In addition to the typical towing cables the set also includes cables for pulling trucks up while they are replacing or repairing by the crew. They are definitely thinner with smaller ends and I always try to arrange them in some interesting way, not necessarily on the handles intended for that purpose. Let's call it controlled disorder. The easiest way is to glue them to the model unless you want to paint them separately. From my experience I prefer the solution you see here because you know. Adding glue to the painted elements don't always roll out the way they are supposed to. One of the main cables was also glued to the kit and the second was planned to place on the exhausts. We are slowly approaching to the end so I show you making hangers for the side covers. I have determined that there will be 5 armor plates on each side but I won't add all of them. Two for sight are enough. I used 0.5mm sheet of plastic to cut them out. In real these plates would be around 12mm thick so perhaps they would be sufficient to provide cover for the vehicle. From the inside I installed handles which were made from a tiny metal plate. Each was supplemented with screws. To keep line and spacing even I drilled through all the places where they were supposed to be. This helped the precise gluing of the nuts. I made the lower brackets from another piece of photo etched plate, which I cut and bent to the desired shapes. And finally a bit of super extra detailing. The small handles for attaching nets, branches or racks 
were bent from copper wire and glued to the hull. Later they are treated through with uh, thin wire which in my experience almost always looks cool on models. What camouflage should be presented on the model? Well, because painting in unpainted steel plates is already cliched and rather everything has been said in this topic, I asked myself where to look for inspiration. It hit me. World of Tanks is a perfect source. After all, in this game we use hundreds of non-existing tanks and various strange camouflages. In fact, I didn't have to search for a long time. To make it easier I chose the Yacht Panther from my vehicles because of the similar shape and tested various options on it. I found it quite fast because the camo you see caught my eye at the very beginning. Of course I took it as the inspiration and didn't want to copy it in 100%. I made a print screen on my phone and started to analyze the construction of this painting. There are six colors. The base is similar to Panzer Grey, farther darker almost black, third is rotten green, fourth is mustard, fifth is bright yellow and sixth is very light but not white, more ivory. It looked great to me and this mix of colors was stunning for my monster. Ok. I already know which way to go, the pattern is ready for use, the colors are defined, we can start disassembling the model into prime factors. Such a curiosity. I put the whole model on weight and showed 560 grams. Quite good. I used blue tack for some parts so I had to carefully peel it off. What can I say? There isn't rocket science in it and no special skill is needed. Look here for a while. Can you see this huge screw stuck in the middle of the model? This will be my working holder. It holds quite well and the model has never fallen off. Of course the screw will stay inside forever. I covered all metal parts with a metal primer. It's important to do it as accurately as possible, although the product is transparent and sometimes you cannot see where you have pulled the brush. I didn't use an airbrush on it, so I don't know how it behaves when sprayed. Someone has already done this? Let me know in the comments. All parts were thoroughly primed and then I sprayed a light grey primer all over the model. Straight out of the can, shaken, not stirred. And now some of the factory primer which I made earlier and keep it ready for use. My recipe is XF9 and XF7 in equal parts with a little amount of the thinner added to have easy and smooth flow through the airbrush nozzle. It's always sprayed on the low parts of the model, especially those that won't be painted with camouflage color. So the bottom of the hull, its sides and inner surfaces of the wheels. That's my habit. And we start camo painting. First a dark foundation. From previous arrangements I figured it would be a NATO black. And so I started, but already while painting I realized that it isn't quite what I wanted. It wasn't bluish enough, not like Panzer Grey. So a few drops of blue and the situation changed. Now I could cover the entire hole with the base color. Look at this drive wheel. Well, probably for some it will be unacceptable, but I like such effects. Even if it's covered with mud, it's still worth playing with such details. I also used the last drops of diluted paint to cover the road wheels. I used a darker tone for the next mix. The result was almost black. A bit of thinner, I mean a tap water, and I started to paint dark camo spots. The effect is similar to invisible German camo from beginning of the war. Do you remember the discussions about it on the modeling forums? Yeah, a couple years ago everything was so complicated, but we are having a laugh now, right? Here too, when dry the color is quite blended into the previous shade, but that's how it should be. Another color now number 3. Before painting I thought slate will fit well but then I changed it for bronze green. It was a good step. I applied it the same way and manner. 
Damn, where are my gloves? From now all the colors will be brighter and brighter. The first one and at the same time fourth in order is mustard. I was surprised by its good coverage. I thought it would be necessary to paint two coats, but it was nice to see it, how perfectly it came out after drying. Now even lighter but more yellow. It was a mixture of three paints because I had nothing close to what I wanted to get. The camo is almost ready and now all that's left to do is tweak and make it similar to the one in World of Tanks. The most noticeable are flecks of yellow, the fifth color. I mixed the paints again and painted them here and there. The rest of the paint was used to color the road wheel in some specific way. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I can paint the rest of the model. Let's start with the barrel. I opted for grey anti-heating paint, first of all to calm down the colorful appearance of the whole body and secondly to add the interesting element that will stand out from the hull. The basic shade was XF24 but I found it too dark and I sprayed the barrel with the brighter XF54. Both shades perfectly completed each other as a base and lightening. I was happy with the result. Then I painted machine gun and flag bars with German grey, which is as good as black to me. The most important is the polishing and metallic shine, which will be done later with pigment and pencil. Yes, I forgot to add light stripes on the flag barrel. It's important to control the amount of paint to not clog the small holes on these parts. <laughs> All this talk about painting and I almost did it myself. The side shields were the second element to contrast with crazy camo on the hull. Here I had no doubts that it should be something in a sandy shade. For this I used real color paints from AK. The base color was lightened with small amount of really light tone. The other side remained in minia shade. Now the side hangers for the shields. The whole thing with the brackets was painted dark brown. I used the brush only, it was faster and more accurate than painting with an airbrush. I didn't want to mask the entire model. Now metallic shine on the weld lines. Those on the hull and those on the hangers. Then I made an acrylic wash with silver and covered all the previous brown painted elements. I fastened it drying with a hair dryer. Well I see that the job is going quite smoothly. We continued to color the next elements and now we will focus on the tarps. There are two, the bigger and more visible one and the smaller one on the engine plate. For now I have painted only one color. I left the shadows and highlights for later. Another elements are towing cables. I covered them all over with faded green and allowed to dry before general weathering. And again silver paint for coral detailing. This time I played a bit with the wheels. The teeth on the drive wheels and the surfaces that touch the tracks had to be polished so their metallic color was fully justified. The same for all road wheels. And remember to correct all the places. Surely the brush will come off more than once. 
The grey paint on the barrel was dry enough and I was sure it wouldn't be torn off by the masking tape. Especially that the whole thing was previously covered with a good metal primer. So I masked the even stripes with masking tape, sprayed gently the paint with an airbrush and after a while I started to peel off to see how the barrel rings of Victory came out. Perfect. Ok, painting is complete. All details were already colored and ready for weathering. I could take care of the markings. For this model I chose a mix of various decals from my collection. Each sticker comes from a different set. These are mainly from Dragon models but of course also those that I bought especially for this project with the names of the vehicles and information cards for the fire extinguishers. The small tactical markings are from Archer. Of course, before applying the stickers I covered the surface with glossy varnish. I'm old fashioned and I prefer not to risk with shining decals. When the stickers were set I covered all of them with the set solution from Microscale which softened them and pressed them exactly into the surface of the model. I let them dry and that was practically all I had to do before weathering started. Before washing I covered the model with a satin varnish which will make the application of the paint easier. I prepared a mix of white spirit and wash in a metal container. I put this mixture on the model. The point is to not unnecessarily cover the places where the wash is unwanted. And if this happens I immediately wrap it off with a clean brush and thinner. I try to work on sections to control the drying process and effects on particular elements like wheels or welding lines. Just use the hair dryer to speed the work up. The very brown paint, more precisely green brown from AK, is a great solution when you need to paint some chips and scratches. The main thing is a good brush, properly diluted paint and a steady hand. And of course randomness but also common sense. The chips rarely show up in hard to reach places unless the paint is peeling off there due to old age or poor primer. In addition to the brush I also used a sponge which significantly accelerated the painting process but also gave a great effect. In general painting this barrel took me several minutes. Then I started to paint the chips on the hull. The scratches on light colors are more visible than on dark shades, it's obvious. Exactly because of this I have limited their amount on dark colors. Besides, due to the nature of camo, I didn't want to overdo it with the quantity because a lot is happening on the model when it comes to painting. All scratches painted so far have been supplemented by speckling. Thanks to this paint particles created microchipping all over the model. I really like this technique because it saves time and is super efficient. Small scratches look natural and appear in quite random places on the model but at the same time their application is quite easy to control. I painted the scratches on the side covers in exactly the same way. First a little speckling method, then gently sponge mainly on the edges. It can also make long scratches. And finally standard brush painting. The long scratches are the most effective but here you need to keep a steady hand because there is no room for a mistake. And done. Perfecto. Super duper. Now let's play a little with oil paints. My proven and old colors are dark and light rusty shade. They are perfect for the rust effect on scratches. I put small amounts of oil paint on the spots painted in previous stages with brown and leave it for a few moments. Then I blended the paint with a clean brush moistened in thinner and let it dry. The intensity of the effect and the range of the color depend on our skilled hand. The amount of the thinner is crucial because if we give too much of it, the paint will melt on the surface and it won't be visible properly.
I did exactly the same on the hull. For the rusty oil paints I added 4 shades to paint the dirt, from black through medium grey to light grey. First I used them to create a dirty surface effect around the mystery brackets that I mentioned in the episode about building this model. You can see it if you haven't done so already by clicking on the link above. The individual shades were mixed together and tapping into the surface of the model. It's a simple technique but takes a moment. It's worth to change the brush to a clean one. If we are not satisfied with the effect it can be roughly washed off with a thinner. To emphasize the fresh weld seams I paint them with silver paint as if they were made in the field and the staff didn't have time to paint them. It's a logical combination with the dirt we just made. I also use the same paint to color the wire handles. Now a rare scene among modelers a wash made of silver paint. I made it also in previous episode and here I continue building of the effect. With the addition of tap water I applied it to the brown parts of the side shield hangers. Thanks to this they gained a metallic appearance. The most important thing is to control that the paint doesn't accumulate in the cavities because it will look unnatural. And of course we accelerate drying with a hair dryer. After that I additionally used a soft pencil and scratched the hangers vertically and horizontally. Of course I also painted the weld lines with silver just like on the hull. And this section is ready. Now some rust. Of course I still use products that were used before. In this case they were oil paints that I applied in various ways to create a unique effect. It was a quick job. Easy peasy. There are minor welding marks but this time I painted them with acrylic paint. Natural grey turned out to be perfect. Of course it has to be done without a mistake when we already have a silver filter and weld seams color. I was working more on the traces of welding and I put on delicate wash to tone their color down. However on the hangers I decided to pull the color again. Wash turned out to be too strong. Let's focus on towing cables preparation. First of all a wash was applied to the whole element and perfectly emphasized the rope weave. After it dried I prepared a lighter shade of paint to apply the chips. For this I used a sponge and started applying the paint to the entire rope. All bright scratches were filled in the same way but with the dark brown I used before. I painted the scratches in the middle of the ends with a brush because the sponge won't fit there. This place is most likely to be stripped of paint when using a rope. When the paint was completely dry I prepared a rusty wash and applied it to the entire length of the rope. All the chips will be perfectly rusted in this way and in addition a rust filter will appear on whole element. After it dried I was able to gently polish the edges of the ends and thus emphasize the rope's weave even more. The exhaust were another element to paint and do some weathering. In the beginning the part closest to the hull was painted dark brown and the flamfernichters were in the basic dark grey color. 
The light grey was applied with the sponge on the lower parts of the Flammvernichters as a base for the rust that will appear there in a moment. First more oil paint was applied in the lower areas and then more thinned paint was spread out. It was something like a rusty wash. As it dries off I expect a thin paint flakes around the entire exhaust. I polished the screws around the Flammvernichter silver with a soft pencil. What I didn't show is the identical finish of the lower parts of the mufflers. Later I will put a black pigment on the exhaust to simulate the fumes. And this is how they look like after being glued to the model. The asymmetrical setting does a really great job and looks like Volkswagen tuning set. After that I load the airbrush with portion of matte varnish and spray it around the kit. It was my favorite Tamiya XF86 which I used for all my models. After matte finish was done I started to spray the buff coat to have good base for pigments application. It is not necessary but I like to make some initial dusting in this way. On the side shields and the chassis you can see how the Minya color is making dust in a few seconds. A thin layer is enough, it can be transparent. I did the same for other elements that could be dusty in the real tank, but I didn't want it to be too dusty because it's a model only. On the other hand, sometimes you can see military vehicles where the dust and mud are so high that doing them on the model would be criticized even though it would reflect the actual appearance of the vehicle. And now the most messiest part, the pigments in action. Despite the fact that this part of weathering always means more or less cleaning of the workbench, I like to work with them. I don't think that they are better than ready-made enamel or acrylic products for making mud because I use them too, but maybe because I started my serious weathering adventure with them? I don't know. But to the point. The first steps were applying a layer of pigments to the whole surfaces and fixing them with white spirit. I applied several layers to build a nice looking structure. Once it was ready I let it dry and took care of the dirt on the wheels. So as not to forget I made dirty the wheels on the inside and of course fixed them with white spirit. Then I started to gradually apply pigments to the wheels from the most visible side. As you can see a sweaty finger is a welcomed tool in this process. Yes, I know, it doesn't look very good but it works. The protruding edges of the wheels perfectly get rid of the pigments excess when I run my finger over them. It was exactly what I expected. Let the work go on and I would like to mention my wonderful patrons who support my activity. Massive thanks guys. Please don't forget that you can be one of them. It's very easy because now there is a chance to enter this superb group without pay a penny for 7 days free trial. This way you can check whether you like what I publish for my patrons or not. Your support is highly appreciated and helps me do what I do here at Coldemons PL and what I love the most. Thanks to this I will try to give you some interesting content to keep you informed and entertained. I made a fine paste by mixing pigment and white spirit in separate vessel. This thick mud then has a nice structure and behaves like the real one. And again I use my finger. The bottom of the hill also got the right amount of dirt. I glued the pigment on a wet surface. Additionally I moistened it with white spirit again. And then I had to do some natural rubbing of the mud as a result of scrubbing of the hull over uneven terrain, bushes, grass and whatever else you can meet in the field. 
A cotton bud is very useful for this purpose because it crushes the pigment lumps on the surface of the model nicely. It can be rolled or we can tap with it, the choice is yours. With the brush I also worked out the characteristic long strokes on the mat. Finally, a toothpick that I made oblong scratches from branches or other harder elements. Generally, this game can last all day. You need to know what effect you want to get. And the question, how will I speed up the drying? Well, of course, by the hair dryer. A bit of mud for shields will also come in handy. As you can see I use the same solution as on the hull. The main thing is not to overdo it. The front fenders were lost in action and the natural consequence was the accumulation of large amount of dry mud in these areas. For the realistic effects I even used the scraps that fall from the brush onto the paper. Small lumps of pigment are great for building an interesting structure. I built it exactly the same as before, the same technique and the same products were used. A few drops of fixer and the pigment sits perfectly in place. The most important thing is not to overdo it with the quantity. The rule is simple, better less than more. You can add more if needed but take a break before you put the brushes into again. I put some pigments on the covers, used the cotton bud and now they look even better with more colors. The pigments are best when glued to the surface and so I did by soaking them with white spirit. Of course, we accelerate the drying time. And another interesting concept for detailing. I didn't make it up by myself, I found a picture on the internet with a wire wound around the wheel in a truck vehicle. It is also a real life idea. Looks great. The most important thing is that the wire should be in correct size. Let's play with pigments on the upper surfaces. I use the rule that dusting is used to increase the contrast between the individual elements of the model. Here you can see exactly how I apply the pigment around the hatch, how much the visual perception of the surface is changing. I remove the excess of the pigment with a soft brush. I do the same in nooks and crannies where the dust naturally collects on real vehicles. Nobody goes there or wipes the surface with a uniform or equipment. Sometimes you can even throw lumps like the one you saw on the front plate. The dried blades of grass will do the job too, but maybe next time. We also dust other elements and surfaces. A tarpaulin to unify it with the rest of the vehicle, the sides of the hull and whatever else you want. There is nothing to be afraid of unless we assume that the model will be constantly touched with bare fingers. And remember that the only builder can do this. We go back to the chassis. Click the link above to check how to paint the tracks. And the lower hull needs a little more love. It must be wet, even more then I will be happy. How to do it? It's very easy. A few drops of wet effects from MIG Productions, White Spirit and you're done. My mix is dirty because I used a brush to apply pigments, but it doesn't matter. How we apply this mix to the model is not so important, just remember it should be relatively random. I was snapping like a cigarette, but I was also painting it in normal way. And now the question, how to put it all together? Hull, wheels and side covers. It's known that such a vehicle gets dirty so you have to keep a consistency and dirty all these elements in some logical way. A little wet on the wheels, here we can play. I assumed in advance that only the edges would be wet. Further side covers. No craziness, only a little speckling to add some fine spots and it's ready. Now it's time to put the trucks on. Well, it wasn't easy to record this job because the white of the trucks and the side shield mounted before were also not a good option and I should add them after trucks mounting. Well, it finally works and looks stunning. I was wondering if this small surface would hold such a heavy element. 
I decided to help the material a little and sanded it with a coarse sandpaper. It was about mating the surface and even tearing it off so that the glue had something to grab. I used the Black Widow from AK because it allowed me to maneuver this element a bit before it completely dry out. A piece of plastic for the support and the model rest for several minutes without touching or moving it. And it worked. Even the barrel moves and it doesn't fall off. However, I should put one more screw on the counterweight. Well, man learns from his mistakes. I will paint super effects of everyday service and signs left by the crew every day. The oil stains, spilled fuel, various liquids such as water will look very natural and will certainly increase the realism of the model. It's always like that. The dark brown oil paint diluted in different proportions is a great solution. We need to control its drying and the traces it leaves. Their location must be reasonable, although photos of the real vehicles confirm that sometimes stains appear in strange places and it's difficult to imagine what happened that they are placed there. In my experience this effect has to be repeated twice and then we have the best results. I correct deficiencies and strengthen here and there what is already almost ok. Here you can easily leave up the muddy finish of the chassis. Because not only on the wheels but also on the hull, these stains can be easily painted. For this purpose I use the same oil as a moment ago but I also mix it with a dark wash or even apply the wash alone without the thinner. It all depends on pigment absorption. Easy, no rush, you can build cool effects and control the drying process. When we are at the chassis a few screws can be colored with a pencil, just like here. Now the exhaust fumes, a black makeup with pigments without fixing to maintain the proper texture, fast and easy. I planned to add a few details to the engine plate to diversify its final appearance. Eureka XXL resin products were ideal for this. Previously I glued them together and painted them in the base color and now they have to be slightly tinted with pigments to make them look like real crates and canisters in the service. Of course I applied the wash earlier and now the pigment has turned to work. The chain is also a necessary element on my models. I prepared the solid piece by soaking it in burnishing fluid. Now I cut off only the pieces I need and adjust to my kits. I won't make too much on it so I will stain it with pigment to tone down the rusty color. It's perfect for tying towing cables as I mentioned earlier. And I will also hang one piece on the left side. And now the wire. Do you remember how I said that its thickness on the model is very important? In my opinion nothing worse than too thick wire that will spoil the whole effect. And even super painting won't be as important as the damn wire which has the thickness of the entrance rope. I have these wires from some electronics cable. I roll them up and put them in a cup with blackening liquid. There is one downside of this fluid. It weakens the wire and therefore tears easily during work. But it can be repaired and after look even more realistic. The small holders were added exactly for this purpose. Remember about some random arrangement and not to hang it in places where the crew would have problems with moving on the vehicle. This is probably not up for discussion. And thanks to the burnishing liquid I didn't have to paint it. Generally it was dark brown but even where it was silver I left it because the time spent on painting is not worth the effect. The wire is just too thin. Blasphemy but that's what I do. The bars of the light guns were polished with a metallic finish. And when we are in this subject, look what I have. I thought that I would use these shells for a machine gun, but the Germans used bags for empty shells. They look great, but I will leave them for some other project. Well, but 20mm shells are must use items. Just take a look. It's a pure perfection. 
Each of them was washed and that's enough. I had done this before and it works. No painting is needed. Now some arrangement and we can stick them. The best for this is the AK gravel and sand fixer. We need just a little of glue for such small elements. If necessary the application must be repeated. And check the surface after drying. Now a bit of polishing with a pencil and creating a metallic finish on the edges. Nothing big and I recommend to use the pencil with moderation. It's easy to ruin all previous works done on the model. Now one of the last things I had to do on the model. I decided to write something with a right crayon on the side shield as if it was painted with chalk or some piece of brick. I wanted to duplicate the tactical number of the vehicle. I have this set of black and white crayons for a while but haven't had a chance to check it out. It was waiting for proper time and it just came. It was necessary to sharpen the crayon to make the line as thin as possible. I had only one approach because as I checked the eraser didn't perfectly clean the surface. First I practiced on a piece of black paper, then in air close to the kit and finally on the model. Ok guys, no stress. It was done on the first try. A few brush strokes to align with the paint and it's ready. Looks great to me. The lettering is even and pretty nice. Someone did a good job. Well, that would be all when it comes to the model itself. But I wouldn't be myself if I didn't add figures. Thanks to Alternity Miniatures I was able to add super figs that perfectly match the what if atmosphere. I decided to use four figures. Three soldiers and one kid, all in gas masks. They are really unique and after replacing the heads you can use them in the standard diorama. First I check them and they fit the model almost perfectly. I put a few curled tarpaulins under the back of one to make it sit evenly and that's it. Ok, now a bit relaxed atmosphere and some backstage shots to show how it all is done when the camera is not pointed exactly at your hands. Taking the pictures is also a tedious job and sometimes it takes a while to find some nice shots. What's more, here the model is really big and it was hard to cover it with the frame. For the final layout I use the super wooden stand from Miniature Bases. You will find a link to the manufacturer in the description. I highly recommend them because they are great and you can adjust the stand to your individual requirements. Write to the manufacturer and buy it. I am very happy with them and I use one for the E60 and one for here. You will see it in a moment. And now I'm waiting for your opinions, write what you like the most about this model and what sucks. And that's all I have for you today. If you like this video don't forget to click like button. 
Be sure to check out my Instagram because there you will find interesting photos from my collection. It's also worth visiting my blog and reading a few short articles about my models. Do I need to remind you to subscribe to the channel and write comments? I think so. So, before ending of this video, click the subscribe button and write a few words of comment. Take a look at the other videos I've posted so far and check out the channel next Monday. That's all for today, see you next time, cheers!